Huh? What? The Great Lakes are in the wrong place. No. No, no, I mean no, not just the Great Lakes. All the lakes are. Let's see, uh, Lake Baikal is? Um, Lake Ladoga is way over in Western Finland. Um, oh yeah, the Aral, yeah, look at the Volga River, yeah, boy. Yeah, all the lakes are and stuff. Hey, you know what it's like? It's like, okay, imagine you had a computing machine and you could make visual layers on it to create an overall picture, but an uncaught human error had accidentally shifted one of those layers slightly. A layer of lakes and rivers. Yeah, yeah, that would be a cool machine, huh? Yeah, all right. Okay, see ya. February 10th, 1945. For months now, the Allies have wanted to cross the Ruhr River and then make their way to the Rhine. Thing is, the Ruhr has a bunch of dams and there was always the worry that the Germans would sabotage them and flood the river, making it impassable. This week, that worry becomes reality. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Allied elimination of the Colmar pocket in Alsace continued, taking Colmar itself. The Allied advance in Luzon reached Manila. The Allied advance in Burma reached Pakoku. And the Allied advance, well, the Soviet advances, all along the Eastern Front began to slow down dramatically, though they have reached the German border in force. Earl Zimke has this to say about that. For the German people, the first week of February was the darkest of the war. The coming months would bring despair and destruction, but not another shock equal to the sudden appearance of the Russians on the Oder River. Three weeks earlier, the front had still been deep in Poland and nowhere on German soil. Now Upper Silesia was lost. In East Prussia, a German army was being cut to pieces. West Prussia and Pomerania were being defended by a skeleton army group under a novice commander, and the defenses of the Oder would have to be entrusted to armies that had already been defeated on the Vistula and chased across Poland. If the Russians maintained their rate of advance, they would be on the Rhine in another three weeks. On the 4th, at Yalta, a conference begins, attended by Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and Franklin Roosevelt, about what exactly is going to happen when the war is over and... Okay, well, it's about a lot of things. We did a little series of news flashes about that conference, so I'm not going to cover it again here, but you can check them out. The conference begins, though, with a summary of the military situation. Alexei Antonov talks about the recent Soviet adventures. In the three weeks since the Red Army went over to the offensive on January 12th, from the Neiman down to the Carpathians, they have had huge success, as we've seen. Knowing the central sector would be strongly defended, they launched the flanking offensives we saw in Hungary and East Prussia, which drew away the German armor as planned. Heck, there are still 11 panzer divisions in the general neighborhood of Budapest. And in the center, with overwhelming force, the Red Army advanced 30 kilometers a day, over 500 kilometers total, taking industrial Silesia, reaching the Oder in force, and even cutting off East Prussia. The German army during these battles lost some 400,000 men, and like 45 divisions have been destroyed. Those offensives, though, have been through a period of relative quiet just lately. First Belarusian commander Georgi Zhukov realizes that even though his spearheads are only some 55 kilometers from Berlin, he is not going to make a high-speed offensive and take Berlin off the march. Stavka decided this at the end of last week, but it's pretty apparent by now to all. Germany might not field mighty armies anymore, but German resistance has seriously stiffened, and the various Soviet fronts, they've been ground down to where they've lost much of their offensive edge. Stavka is also quite worried about the 150-kilometer gap between Zhukov's front and Konstantin Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front. There are plenty of Germans in Pomerania facing that gap, and an awful lot more trapped in the rear in Courland or East Prussia. 
Zhukov's open flank was no simple visual phenomenon derived from general staff maps, but a dangerous gap filling at an alarming rate with German divisions, 33 of which were piling up in Pomerania, and only 13 diverted to the Berlin axis itself. The buffeting, which Soviet divisions suffered in early February, was real enough. OKH chief Heinz Guderian has been pestering Adolf Hitler lately for a German offensive from the Glogau area and from Pomerania, which he thinks would do well against the weakened Soviets. And you'd think Hitler would be all for it, but he's actually not. He doesn't really consider it even, and instead continues moving 6th SS Panzer Army to Hungary. He also does not consider evacuating Courland or bringing in troops from Norway, Italy, or the Balkans for counterattacks. He does allow Guderian to plan a limited attack from around Stargard to try and keep Pomerania in German hands. This is to be launched in a few days. That meeting takes place today the 10th, and you know what else does? New attacks by 2nd and 3rd Belarusian fronts. These are ordered by Stavka VIII and call for Rokossovsky's 2nd to savage East Pomerania and reach the line from the mouth of the Vistula across to Neustettin by the 20th. After that, his left is to drive for Stettin and his right to take Danzig and Gdynia and clear the Baltic coast down to the Pomeranian Bight. Ivan Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front is to destroy the German 4th Army in East Prussia, eliminating the enemy south of Königsberg by the 25th at the absolute latest. There's been some shuffling around of forces and fronts by Stavka to hopefully make all this easier. As of the 6th, 1st Baltic gets three armies from 3rd Belarusian. To compensate for that, 3rd Belarusian gets three armies and a tank corps from 2nd Belarusian. The idea behind this is for Rokossovsky to focus solely on East Pomerania, Chernyakovsky focusing on crushing German 4th Army, then 1st Baltic focusing on Königsberg and Samlan. So, Rokossovsky has now 45 rifle divisions against 13 German infantry and two panzer divisions, and some battle groups. He and Chernyakovsky, who now has 63 divisions, attack simultaneously today, as I said, but the first day does not make all that much progress. Still, one effect of the fighting. By mid-February, 1.3 million of the 2.3 million population of East Prussia have evacuated, mainly walking towards Danzig. Now, on the 8th, further down the Eastern Front, Ivan Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front begins their new attacks from the Steinau bridgehead north of Breslau. These are pretty successful, and by the very end of the week, they've broken through more than 50 kilometers on a front more than twice that width. They've surrounded the Germans in Glogau, reached the Bobr River, and they're poised to make a run for the Neisse River. Adolf Hitler still thinks the most strategically important part of the Eastern Front is the Najikanissa oil fields in Hungary, where the Germans are by now getting at least three quarters of their oil from. But even around there, it's the Soviets who have the initiative. On the 5th, Hitler refuses a request from the Budapest garrison to try to break out. He says they wouldn't succeed anyhow. On the 6th, he orders Army Group South Commander Otto Wöhler to station four of the panzer divisions from 6 SS Panzer Army near Gyur and the other one behind Najikanitsa when they arrive. They are to remain directly under control of OKH, and their presence is to remain secret. Hitler predicts a Soviet drive on Vienna, and the army group's job is to prevent that, to hold on to Kamarno, Najikanitsa, and Czechoslovakia. And as for those enemy forces aiming right at Germany, today he issues an order to destroy all enemy bridgeheads over the Oder within 48 hours. As for the situation in Budapest itself, the garrison by this week is down to its last ammunition and is holed up in two pockets, neither of which is large enough to receive airdrops. Today, the 10th, Hitler awards garrison commander Karl Pfeffer Wildenbruch the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Much like with Jose Paulus, I got to say that one more time, yeah. much like with him at Stalingrad, this is meant to boost morale. It doesn't really do so, and the Soviets take strong point after strong point, day after day in the city, and today, the whole of Southern Buddha except for the citadel, which will fall tomorrow. Despite Hitler's orders, as the week ends, Pfeffer Wildenbruch is considering a breakout. 
Someone else is defying Hitler's orders to hold this week over on the Western Front. Okay, on the 5th, the Colmar pocket is cut in two when the French and Americans link up in Rufach, trapping four German divisions. German 19th Army Commander Siegfried Rasp, without authorization, begins moving units back over the Rhine. The next few days, the French 1st Army spends clearing the pocket. 19th Army doesn't even have a coherent defense there anymore. On the 9th, two French divisions meet by the Rhine Bridge at Chalampé, which the Germans blow in the morning, and this is the symbolic end of the Colmar Pocket. The Allies have taken nearly 14,000 casualties in the battles, of which three quarters were French. And they've also taken another 7,115 non-combat casualties, mainly from frostbite and trench foot. As for their enemy, from November until January 20th, 19th Army lost 24,000 men as POWs, and as far as I can tell, an unknown number of dead and wounded. Then, from the 20th to this week on the 8th, 16,000 more POWs and maybe 9,000 more in battle. Hard to say exactly, but fewer than 10,000 men have escaped the pocket, and German 19th Army no longer exists as an actual fighting force, with divisions down to maybe 500 men. The whole point of the German Nordwind offensive was to tie down Allied forces here so they could not be used to fight against the Ardennes offensive. But by the time Nordwind started, the fate of the Ardennes offensive had already decisively shifted against Germany. The original rationale had evaporated. The Wehrmacht reflexively continued its Alsace counteroffensive, heedless of whether it had any plausible operational goal. Hitler had grown increasingly nihilistic after the failure of the Ardennes attack and accepted a bloody battle of attrition as reason enough to continue the Alsace fighting. This made little sense. The Wehrmacht was attacking with weak, second-rate infantry in adverse terrain and weather conditions with little panzer support and pathetically thin stocks of artillery ammunition. The outcome was seldom in doubt. The Sylvester offensives cost the Wehrmacht far more than it cost the Allies. And also, consider that the fighting the last five weeks has deprived the Germans of resources and time to prepare for an inevitable invasion of Germany in the West. The Allies are already invading Germany at places in the West, though. On the 7th, U.S. 3rd Army units move into Germany over the Ur, and by the 9th are attacking near Prum. Already the 4th, the Allies announced that Belgium is cleared of all German forces. And 21st Army Group Commander Bernard Montgomery's plans to head for Berlin are to begin this week with Operation Veritable the 8th. This is Harry Krerar's Canadian 1st Army, beefed up with British 30th Corps heading southeast from Nijmegen. Two days later, Bill Simpson's U.S. 9th Army, still attached to Monty's Army Group, is to attack northeast across the Ruhr in Operation Grenade. 340,000 men in the former, 300,000 in the latter, but the latter beefed up with 75,000 more on their right in Joe Collins' 7th Corps. The Americans and Canadians and British will join shoulder to shoulder on the Rhine and swamp the industrial Ruhr. Well, that's the plan. But to cross the Ruhr, as I've discussed ad infinitum the past three months, the upstream dams, specifically now the Erft and Schwamenuel dams, need to be taken to prevent the Germans from massively flooding the river. Efforts in the late fall to capture or bomb the waterworks had failed, and damn the dams, remained a tiresome malediction in American headquarters. Not until those bugaboos were eliminated could the Ruhr be vaulted, the Rhine attained, and the Ruhr be captured. Well, they do manage to take the Erft Dam, and fighting over the course of the week, the 78th Division, backed by a regiment from 82nd Airborne and then 9th Division, recover ground from the Hürtgen Forest Battles of the Fall and finally even take Schmidt and Lo and behold, on February 9th, they reach the Schwamenuel Dam and find it intact. The Germans fight back, of course, but the Americans enter the base of the dam, 304 meters thick at its base and holding back 75 billion liters of water to find no explosives. 
engineers had calculated that German demolitionists would need a half million pounds of TNT to blow a hole in the massive structure. But mortal wounds had already been inflicted. Yep, the power room and the discharge valves have been wrecked, and the floodgates halfway down the dam are pouring a cascade of water five meters wide. The Germans have also jammed open a valve from the Erft Reservoir, so the valley here is flooded from the ninth by hundreds of millions of liters of water. This is not a tsunami that engulfs the Americans, no. It is a rising tide, but it keeps on rising so Operation Grenade is pushed back. We'll see for how long. That depends on how long the river is flooded. The current is way too fast for bridging, and bank to bank, which is usually 30 meters across, is 30 times that in places. Operation Veritable proceeds, though, and that is planned for three phases. They are to first clear the Reichswald and take the nine Kleve to Gennep to Asperden, Phase two is to break into the German defense system east and southeast of the Reichswald and take Kalkar, Udem, and Wiese and secure communications there. And then phase three is to break through the Hochwald defense and take a line generally from Zanten to Geldern. The whole thing begins with a frontal assault against prepared defenses. And even with lots of armor, that sounds tough. So. On the 7th, the RAF massively bombs Kleve and Goch with high explosive shells, and the British fire off their heaviest artillery barrage since El Alamein, over a thousand big guns. The plan is to destroy not only the defenses, but also the defenders' morale. At 10.30 the 8th, Veritable is launched by five divisions, Canadian 3rd and 2nd, 15th Scottish, 53rd Welsh, and 51st Highland. That's like 50,000 men and they have 500 tanks. They make pretty good progress on day one, but yesterday and today the fighting is heavy. German commander in the west, Gerd von Rundstedt, has been told by Hitler that he cannot withdraw behind the Rhine and must fight here. But the floods mean that he can at least concentrate force against the Canadians and British. 30th Corps commander Brian Horrocks orders the 43rd Wessex Division to come in and bypass Kleve and hit the German rear. 15th Division is trying to capture Kleve, but since there's only one road, these two and the Scottish Division, the center and the left of the assault, end up creating a massive traffic jam nearly 20 kilometers long. Kleve still holds as the week ends, and 47th Panzer Corps has been called upon to hold it and the Reichswald. However, after the fight in the Ardennes, its two divisions are only around 50% strength and don't even have 100 tanks total, so we'll see about that. And over in the Philippines, the Japanese begin the fight to hold on to Manila. Sidetrack first. At Santo Tomas University in Manila, which is being used as a prison camp by the Japanese, and which American forces, literally the cavalry turning up, broke into as last week ended, 3,785 people are liberated this week, 2,870 of them American, and most of the rest British. The Japanese released the hostages they took last week in exchange for safe passage. Most of the negotiating is done by British missionary Ernest Stanley. The Japanese leave there the morning of the 5th, and tomorrow the 11th, evacuating the internees begins. Billy Bill Penitentiary, with its POWs, is also liberated this week. Well... The Japanese withdraw from it, but then try and fail to take it back. Okay, the Battle of Manila begins, and it is a real fight. Tomoyuki Yamashita has ordered the city to be an open city, but Sanji Iwabuchi, who commands the naval garrison of 17,000 men, orders them and the 4,000 army soldiers there to fight to the death. The U.S. 11th Airborne is still unable to enter the city from the southeast, but by the 7th, the 37th and 1st Cavalry Divisions have arrived at the city in full force. The Battle of Manila was to be fought with a savagery that made nonsense of MacArthur's February 7th communique, proclaiming that our forces are rapidly clearing Manila and predicting that the complete destruction of the enemy was imminent. Churchill and Roosevelt had cabled their congratulations, but they were premature. Concern for the 700,000 Filipino citizens led MacArthur to forbid the use of aircraft to bomb the enemy's strongpoints. So artillery had to be brought up to blast the Japanese out, building by building. 
Iwabuchi's main defense is in Intramuros, the old walled town south of the river, and its battlements have seriously thick stone walls, which do stand up fairly well to the American shelling. The bridges over the Pazig have been blown by Iwabuchi's naval units, so the only way south is amphibious crossings. His guys also create a huge fire that blows north and destroys much of the northern half of town. And the Americans demolish rows of buildings to make fire breaks. But most of the north of the city is clear of the Japanese by the 7th. This is in large part because they expected an Allied attack to come from the south. Some of the bloodiest fighting the whole Battle of Manila will see is for Provisor Island to take the electric generating plant the last few days of the week. The same can be said for the fight for the Paco railway station. These two fights, though, change the American attitude to the battle as a whole. Before, they were using artillery only on specific targets to try to minimize civilian casualties. From now on, they go over to area bombardment and the battle develops into one that will destroy much of Manila. On February 9th, two days after the first American crossing of the Pazig, a Japanese program of annihilation of Filipinos began. Japanese suspicion and contempt had turned to hatred as the Americans approached and Filipino guerrillas sprang into action alongside the Americans and served as spies and couriers in Manila. All people on the battlefield, an order read, meaning all Filipinos found in the portion of the city under attack, will be killed. The standard procedure for this, seriously, was to round up suspect men and teenage boys, wire them together, soak them with gasoline, stick them into a room piled with flammable materials, then throw in grenades. Many women and girls were set up in hotels and apartments for repeated rapes. Babies and their mothers were not safe either. Individual Japanese soldiers intervened to rescue some of the women but this was a time of the long knives, in this instance, bayonets. There were six recorded instances of babies tossed in the air to be impaled on bayonets. Many women were killed offhand. So that is the urban fight now in the Philippines. A fight of completely different character is going on in Burma. There is yet another mini deception in 14th Army Commander Bill Slim's overall deception plan. The 28th East African Brigade crosses the Irrawaddy at Sekpu noisily, and Japanese Commander Haitaro Kimura, as hoped for, believes this to be just an irregular formation attack trying to distract him from concentrating further north, when it is in fact the opposite, to disguise the progress of 4th Corps in the south and their plan to cross the river and hit Mike Tila. Slim now faced the great, and some thought insuperable, task, the crossing of the Irrawaddy by two corps at different points on the river. In the north, Kimura was supremely confident, with eight divisions plus one and a third divisions of Bose's Indian National Army. Then there was the obstacle of the mighty river itself. It is one of the world's mighty rivers. Over 2,000 kilometers long, two to four kilometers wide at the crossing points, this is the river's low point of the year, yes, sure, but the heavy rains come in March, which isn't that far away. Also, Slim does not have a lot of boats. Kimura's confidence level remains high. What Slim plans to do is to get 4th Corps across in a tight time period before 33rd, who will cross piecemeal over a longer time period before they're finished, right? Since 4th Corps' mission is the vital one, the longer they remain on the western bank, the greater the chance of a fiasco. It looks like the crossings will begin in large numbers next week. And this week is now done. With the fight for Manila getting bloody, flooding stopping one Allied operation even as another gets going, the Kalmar pocket, a thing of the past, a conference in Yalta, and ever more Soviet attacks even as their plans and formations are shifted around. Oh, and on the 8th, Paraguay declares war on Germany and Japan. I began this episode with a quote from Earl Zimke about this week being the darkest week of the war for the German people when the Soviets all turned up on the Oder. It was a bit dramatic, but you know, that's television for you. I will expound on that a bit now. No, he will. 
Zimke writes a bit later on in Stalingrad to Berlin. The Soviet advance from the Vistula to the Oder had astonishingly little visible effect in Berlin. Life in the capital and its close environs, which housed the entire central government and the highest Wehrmacht commands with their main communication centers, continued in its accustomed routine that by then had long included the frequent American and British bombing raids. The exodus of government officials, siege preparations, and panic that had marked the German approach to Moscow in October 1941 were completely absent. Russian tanks might be on the Oder, scarcely a day's running time away, but what was to be done in Berlin still depended entirely upon the Fuhrer. And he was thinking of retaking Budapest, not of defending Berlin. Also, Hitler has insisted that they don't put Germany under direct military control until as late as possible. So that is not close to in the cards. It wasn't even until January 14th that OKH was even authorized by OKW to issue directives about building fortifications in and around Berlin. And the first written order by OKW Commander Wilhelm Keitel came only last week, February 2nd. That order just increased the commander of Wehrkreis III's authority. Wehrkreis III is the military district that contains Berlin. The commander is now responsible for the defense of Berlin and has command of First Flak Division, the Berlin AA, for ground combat. For tactical orders, the commander reports directly to Hitler. But, but that's it. There are no orders to evacuate, to build, to defend the city. Not yet. There are those orders to smash the Soviet bridgeheads on the Oder, though, within 48 hours. So if that happens, then maybe they won't have to defend Berlin. Or maybe there will be an armistice or a surrender before anyone reaches Berlin. Or maybe a new super weapon. Yeah, maybe. As you noticed, I did not talk about the Yalta Conference, a very important one which takes place this week. But we did a series of Time Ghost news flashes to cover it chronologically, and that comes out in a few days. If you want to see an earlier conference again, here is one from December 1943 about the Tehran Conference. All of this and all of that is thanks to the Time Ghost Army, and you too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com to help us make ever more content. The Army Member of the Week is Ivan Malov or Ivan Malov or something like that. And these are the newest commissioned officers. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.